Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justice. I'm the lead pastor of the church, but more importantly than that, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a friend of the, the Kimmer family. Uh, I'm, I'm also here today celebrating alongside with you a great man who impacted so many of our lives. Um, not only a great man, but a handsome man. Did you guys check out the picture that's on that bulletin? Good looking man. Um, I think Gary is famous for saying that he is a good looking man, and so this is only appropriate that we would make sure that, the, that we honor God with his good looks as we talk about him today. Um, over the next few minutes, I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna share a little bit of thoughts as requested from the scriptures, but I'm also gonna kind of MC today as we have many fam, uh, family and friends who are gonna share memories and, uh, and we're gonna celebrate Gary's life. If it's okay with you, I'm gonna call him Mr. Kimmer though the rest of the day, is that okay? I was on the phone with Brandon the other day, and I was like, I've never called him Gary a day in my life. He's always been Mr. Coleman, as uh, Mr. Kimmer is just like Mr. Coleman to you. So, hey, would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? Lord, we come to you this afternoon, and we ask that today's service would honor you. I mean, that's, you, 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 you absolutely honored us by giving us this great man in our life, and we pray that this service would honor you. And that we would look back on today, and we'll have had sh we have shared so many memories and it would just be one of those days where we say that that's exactly how Gary would have wanted it, and it was a it was a beautiful it was a beautiful service where you were in the details and we sensed your presence. So Lord, we pray that that would happen in your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. In a moment here, we're going to hear a song from Brandon. He's going to sing a song for us. Um, but he has asked me to share a little bit from the scriptures, and so I, I know you guys didn't bring your Bible, so that's okay, I understand, but it says in John chapter 11 that Jesus was once at a funeral. We actually have a story where, where Jesus was at a funeral, so we see a little bit about how to behave and what's appropriate and what God would do if God was at a funeral, and in John chapter 11, verse uh, 17, it says, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. And Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house, and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he'll rise again when everyone else rises, the last day, and Jesus told her, no. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Can I just ask you, do you, do you think you're gonna see Gary again? Uh, he, he's a man who loved God. He was a man who believed exactly what Jesus is saying here. He believed that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And this is what Jesus says. He says, for those of us that no people in this life who put their faith and trust in him, we actually do get to see them again. But we also see that, you know, these sisters are, are, that were related to Lazarus, you know, one of them here is actually really upset with Jesus and kind of starts blaming him. And she's saying, hey, if only you could have been here, you could have stopped this. And, you know, as I was just thinking about today and praying for, you know, what to say in these few minutes that I have, I, I just think, and I, and I talked to Brandon a little bit about this, like, you know, I think it's okay to be, to, to kind of be upset and, and talk to God about that. I think it's okay to go to him and say, I don't understand. I'm gonna to try to trust you even though I don't understand. But like, this doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right for this, for this way for Gary's life to end. And, you know, I just, as, I was, as I was praying for you and thinking about the family and everybody here and the, and, and the, the events of his untimely passing, I, just, I believe the Lord would tell you that he can handle you blaming him and talking to him about it. I think that it's appropriate to go to him out on the road. I mean, everybody else is in the funeral and, and, and she, Martha meets him out there privately and has a one-on-one -on -one conversation before Jesus goes inside. And she's like, if you would have been here. And, and Jesus handles it and he takes it. But what he does is he reminds her of who he is. And I think the Lord would just remind us of who he is. He's a good God that we can trust. And even when we don't understand, we can put our faith in him. Is there anybody here today who would say God's been a good God to you? Has he been a good God to you? Has he been faithful to you? You know, a few verses later it says that, that Jesus is walking through, verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing for her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. So we got a few verses before this, we got one of these sisters just blaming Jesus and then we see even Jesus is angry about it here 
And then it, he says, you know, where have you, where have you put him? Lord, come and see. And then we have verse 35, which is the shortest verse in the whole Bible. I don't know if you know this, but the shortest verse in the whole Bible is, is right here. It's Jesus when he weeps at this funeral. And it says so much because, I, mean, I don't know if, if you know the story of Lazarus, but Jesus is about to raise him back to life. Jesus knows that. Jesus knows he's going to see his friend again. He knows that it's all going to work out in the end. Yet it says that he's deeply troubled, that he's even angry, and that he cries. And that, that's such a huge statement about his humanity because Jesus, when he's on earth, he's 100% God, but he's also 100% man. And when he goes to a funeral, he cries. Uh, like, like he's in the moment. Like he, people are blaming him. People are angry. He's angry. And he actually cries. Despite knowing that he's going to raise Lazarus back to life, he, he still cries. He's like, he's present. And I, I just think the only thing that we could probably get wrong today um, that in order to really not honor Gary's life or not really be in the moment would be to, to not be present with the family. And there's going to be moments that, that you have emotion and you know this, and there's going to be times to share um, memories and times to recount times. And th those, those are the moments that this gathering is for. Like even Jesus did that. Even Jesus cried and he was in the moment and it's appropriate. And it's what Jesus would do if you're, if you're a follower of him. That's what he would do. You know, God comforts us in two ways. He comforts us through the Holy Spirit, who he calls the comforter, but then he comforts us through each other. And that's what the body of Christ is. And so my encouragement to you um, is that we would, we would be in the moment today, that we would, we would not let the, 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 the moments pass to share those stories. We would comfort each other. We'd comfort the family. I know it can be like those times where it's like, I don't know, I didn't know what to say. I would say just say it. I would say hug people. Cry if you need to, share a memory, and be a comfort. Just as God has been a comfort to us, be a comfort to one another. Amen? I'm going to invite Brandon up to sing a song. was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord but you don't really care for music do ya well it goes like this the fourth the fifth the minor fall and the major lift the baffled king composing hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew ya. She tied you to her kitchen chair And she broke your throne And she cut your hair And from your lips she drew the Hallelujah 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 There was a time you let me know What's really going on below But now you never show that to me, do ya? Remember when I moved in you The holy dark was moving too And every breath we drew was hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
Я не люблю Я Maybe there's a God above But all I ever learned from love Was how to shoot somebody Who outdrew ya It's not a cry that you hear at night And it's not somebody who's seen the light It's a cold and it's a broken Hallelujah Hallelujah Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Can I say one thing real quick? I just want to say one thing about that song. The reason I chose that song is that um, a couple years ago, my dad was running these Pine Mountain, um, in Pine Mountain, these Christmas in the Villages uh, things that he did every year, which some of you here were probably at. And uh, he, uh, one year, I think it was about three years ago or so, he had me sing that song. Uh, I told, he asked me if I wanted to sing a song, and I said, sure. And so then I, I chose that song. And he absolutely loved it. He loved it so much. And uh, he asked me to sing it again the year after, two years after that, and I was too busy to sing it again. So today, I'm just going to sing it again for him. So there's that. Yeah. Brandon, the reason why he wanted you to sing that song is because it's the only song you know that's not a Weird Al song. True. You honored your dad True. with that song. <laughs> Aren't you glad he didn't sing a Weird Al song this morning? I'm going to invite up um, Pastor, uh, Mr. Kimmer's pastors. Um, this is uh, Rich and Leah Smith. Thank you for driving all the way here today. We are so honored to be here. Um, I remember meeting uh, Marianne and Gary when they started coming to our fellowship and just thinking, it's just so refreshing when people come to your church and they're fed and they love the word and they're excited and they tell other people and they have just been such an inspiration and such an encouragement and um, I just love my sister Marianne tremendously and have um, just been so blessed just by our fellowship together and know that God has this season and many new seasons before us. Um, as I was just sharing with Molly before the service began here, I've been praying and really waiting on the Lord um, and what to share. And as my husband knows, I sleep through the night. Like when we had newborns, he was like, honey, they're crying. It's time to wake up and go feed the baby. <laughs> Um, I, I never wake up in the middle of the night, and the Lord woke me up. I, when I looked at the clock thinking, oh, it's going to be, you know, 5.30, it's time to wake up, and it said 1.48, and I was like, wow, Lord, so I just began praying, and the Lord, um, as I was laying there, began to just speak to my heart about Gary and the love of his Savior Jesus that he lived out for his wife, for his children, and for his friends. Um, in my half-asleep state, I heard this verse recited in my heart, uh, and it was, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. These things I command you, that you love one another. And as I was laying there, I just felt so overwhelmed. Um, I began just praising God for the example of Christ's love lived out through our brother Gary and the impact his life had on so many of us. 
the description of God's agape love just started flowing through my heart. Gary suffered long and was kind. He did not envy and didn't parade himself. He was not puffed up, did not behave rudely. He did not seek his own. He was not provoked. He thought no evil, did not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoiced in the truth. He bore all things, believed all things, hoped all things, endured all things. And as I looked up that passage and as I was praying, um, I began to see the following verses in just a beautiful light, and I wanted to share this with you. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then one day when we too go home to be with our Savior, we shall see Jesus face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know just as we are also known. And Gary is seeing Jesus now, Amen. our amazing God of love, and is complete in his presence. He now knows and is known. And Gary would want all of us here today who remain to follow Christ's example and to abide in Jesus' love, laying down our own lives for one another, just as we witnessed in our brother's life. And so I'd like to just pray for all of us as I believe this was just a sweet message for the Lord, from the Lord for all of us. Father, um, I just thank you so much for our brother's life. And I thank you, Lord, for his love for you, his love for his wife and children and friends and family. Lord, we thank you for sharing his life with us. We thank you for the beautiful work of love you began and have now completed in his life. We thank you for the life that he lived in your love, leaving us a legacy and showing us an example to follow. Help us to abide in your love. Help us to lay down our lives for one another and care for others, Lord, as you care for us. In your holy and loving name we pray, amen. There's a couple of verses I just wanted to finish with. Jesus, when he was praying to the Father in John 17, he said, I in them, he's talking to the Father, you in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The Lord did not wake me up with what I had to share. Um, but this last week I was reading in the Gospel of John chapter 13, and that's the chapter where Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. Uh, but the opening verse in, in chapter 1, or in chapter 13, verse 1, it says that when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And Jesus came into this world with a tremendous sense of clarity of his purpose and his mission. His whole purpose in coming to this earth, and, and this is probably a great Christmas message actually, but, but was to come and to seek and to save the lost. And he understood that to accomplish that mission, he had to lay his life down. And that he was going to suffer and he was going to bear the penalty of our sins so that we could be free. We are saved by his grace. And Gary was one such sinner who was saved by the grace of God. And he knew that he was loved by God. As I was reading through this verse, it was the latter part of it that really kind of focused me in on Gary. Where it says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And I don't imagine that Gary probably had in his mind the idea that his hour had come. As I sat with you guys that Saturday morning, it was a difficult morning and difficult news. But we were hopeful and we were praying and we were waiting to see what God was going to do. And God did what was perfect. He did. But I don't think any of us had in our mind that Gary's hour had come to depart this earth and go be with the Father. We were anticipating that he was going to come home to PMC, not go home to be with our Father in heaven. But God's plans are always perfect. They're not painless, and the cross of Calvary reveals that. 
The cross of Calvary reveals that God's perfect will is not painless, but it is always, always perfect. And like Jesus standing outside the tomb of Lazarus, we too weep and faith trusts. I know as believers, we have a tendency of trying to convince ourselves of what is true because we know that it's true, but, but our, our pain wants to scream the contrary. And if Jesus can weep, then so can we. And we know, for those of us who have been saved by God's grace, we know that Gary is just holding the door open for us, waiting for us to arrive. And I would love to be there today. Jesus knew that his mission was complete. I don't think any of us anticipated that Gary's mission was complete, but it was. Ours? Not yet. Complete. We continue to journey. Gary was the recipient of God's tremendous grace. Again, the last half of that verse, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And that's when I thought about Gary. Mary Ann, he loved you to the very end. And each one of the kids and grandkids. And he did an amazing job being faithful to the God who loved him. God's grace is sufficient. It's intended to be contagious. And Gary received that grace and extended that grace. And here are each one of us continuing to absorb God's grace because we need it today. But know that he wants that grace to be extended. God's grace saves our souls it saves our marriages, it saves our families, it impacts our community. And so Gary leaves behind a legacy of the sufficiency of God's grace. Well said. At this time, we're gonna invite up onto the stage uh, Gary and Mary Ann's children. So we're going to bring Travis and Mary Lynn and Brandon and Molly up here. And they're going to take turns sharing some thoughts and some memories that they've prepared. Up first, we're going to hear from Gary's oldest, Travis. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. You have no idea the amount of comfort and uh, just joy that you guys bring uh, just being here today. So I know siblings, my mom, uh, just appreciate you guys being here. The words of encouragement, the notes, the texts, the emails, uh, you have no idea the impact. Well, <clears throat> who would have thought we'd be here today? Um, no, none of us. Um, you know, and, and how do you summarize my dad's life in five minutes? It's not truly possible. So each one of us kids is going to give our own perspective of our dad in the short time that we have here today. So if my dad were a TV character, he would be a blend of Tim Allen from Home Improvement and Chevy Chase from Christmas Vacation. Allow me to elaborate on that. So just like Tim the Tool Man Taylor, my dad was a man's man, was he not? In fact, I actually remember him doing the caveman grunt from Home Improvement in our house back in like the 1990s. Uh, my dad loved working on construction projects, as you know, and he was really quite the artist, really, in a lot of ways in how he designed the many houses he built or remodeled. My dad had the biggest forearms, hands, fingers, and arms you've ever seen in your entire life, didn't he? Um, I remember, I specifically remember being about eight years old and I looked at his biceps and I said to my dad, and I meant this, dad, did you swallow a bowling ball? <laughs> I, to this day, it was, I genuinely believed he did and I think maybe to this day, I think he did. Yet despite being a man's ma man, my dad was always gentle, kind, and self-sacrificing. I genuinely saw my dad get angry only once or twice in my entire life. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, see, they're all nodding. They know. <clears throat> and like Tim Allen, my dad could also make you laugh until you cried. 
One of my favorite aspects of my dad was whenever he would tell a funny story. How many of you guys here ever had the privilege of hearing my dad tell a funny story, but barely be able to finish himself because he was laughing so hard? You guys know what I'm talking about? Typically, he started the story just fine, but midway through, he would crack up, which only made you laugh even harder. And by the time the story was over, everyone, including my dad, was rolling in laughter. Ultimately, the story was, was secondary. The highlight was my dad's delivery of that story. And then if, if Tom was in the room at the time, forget about it. You couldn't stand a chance between those two. The laughter was just too much. So yes, my dad had the manliness and humor of Tim Allen, but the one main difference between them is that my dad never got hurt or, or, or hurt others in his projects. <laughs> so my dad was also like Chevy Chase from Christmas Vacation, meaning he always wanted what was best for his family and his friends. He was a master at creating an environment where everyone would have the time of their lives. His own enjoyment came from watching others enjoy themselves. For Christmas or Thanksgiving, the decorations were always to the nines. He would wake up before any, everyone else to start breakfast. I mean, is there anything better than waking up to the smell of bacon and eggs? That was my dad. He wanted to create that environment. Okay, so how many of you guys remember my dad's parties back at the Chatsworth house, right? Okay, whether it was the luau or talent shows or live bands. You know, dad didn't do that for himself. He did that for all of us. He did that for all of us, and it's something I'll always remember, and I know all of us will too. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't remember, mention the days of the Subway sandwich shop. Uh, I can't tell you how many people have come to me over these, these past few weeks even and said, your dad was the best boss I've ever had, right? I mean, he just, he was just, he had such a great balance of like fair but firm. For those of the, us that worked at Subway, do you guys remember all those crazy contests he'd do for us? I hear laughter. You know, you, you know where this is going. Uh, we'd have to upsell things like avocado or double meat. But he'd create these elaborate... I think we're gone. Oh, there, there we go. But he'd create these elaborate stories around these contests. And then he'd write them on the whiteboard each day. And I remember one in particular he wrote right around the time the movie Coneheads came out. You remember that? The aliens with the big cones for heads, right? Well, I don't remember my dad's exact words on this whiteboard, but it was something along the lines of this. Attention all employees. A conehead was here last night, and he got his head stuck in the meat slicer. And we now have extra bologna to upsell to our customers. <laughs> so yes, just like Chevy Chase, my dad always created incredible experiences for his family and his friends. Main difference between my dad is my dad's Christmas lights always worked. <laughs> you know, my dad's death is a significant and devastating loss for us all. Um, hmm. In our house, uh, Tracy, Haven, Miley, and myself, uh, we have a common saying whenever we see what's going on in this world, because this world is just crazy, it's messed up, and we say, you know guys, this world is not our home. We say that very commonly because if we didn't have heaven, if we didn't have the future, man, this would be so depressing. And this is, this is sad. But yet there's hope behind that. Death is the worst thing that could possibly happen if there wasn't a heaven afterwards. But here's the reality, there is hope. There's hope after death. Heaven is real, Jesus is real. Uh, and for my dad, he was a Christ follower, no doubt. There's nothing scary for him. Yes, he was kind, he was patient, he was gifted with laughter and love. But those aren't just traits of a man gifted with charisma. Those are traits of a man devoted to godliness, to living out his mission and purpose. He's now in heaven, where some here are heading, but all of us have the opportunity to go. We all here have the opportunity to finish our own version of our God-given mission and purpose, having seen how my dad lived out his faith. We've seen one great man go before us. So how are we in this room going to carry on that same purpose for our communities, for our wives, our children? Faith in Jesus Christ gave my dad's life meaning and purpose. Today, we are the only ones grieving. But ironically, the one man we are grieving is also the one celebrating with Jesus today. 
Thank you. I'm Mary Lynn, and I am the daddy's girl. Sorry, Molly. Um, it's true. She's mama's girl. Anyways, um, so he was my hero, and I loved, 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 loved spending time with him. And he was a very hands-on dad, and I'm the perfect mix of my mom and my dad, like 50-50. Some of the same things that him and I were the same as is we both had the same sense of humor, which some people didn't understand it. We were both very frugal. We had the same emotions, which were kind of nothing, not much. <laughs> we both have um, a ton of nicknames for people, nicknames that don't even make sense to where people would be like, where did you come up with that nickname? Um, so he was known for his extreme optimism. He was extremely optimistic, even during the time that he was sick. He had to talk me down, like, it's okay, Mary Lynn, we'll be fine. And I'm like, Dad, we're not, you know? So. He was very optimistic. Um, so here are some of my memories with my dad. When I was about five or six, he would pick me up every Thursday at school and take me to Chuck E. Cheese for lunch. When I was 11, I worked at Subway until about the time I was 22. And so that was a really long time. And I really enjoyed working with him. Every, probably every Monday, he would take me to breakfast at like 6 a.m. in the morning. And him and I would generally go to Caro's and we would drink our coffee, talk all about Subway, had a great time. Those were like some of my favorite memories with him. Um, he knew also that I was the only kid that if he wanted to go to breakfast at like 5 in the morning, he could come in, knock on my door and say, Mary Lynn, you want to go to breakfast? And I would literally jump right out of bed and be like, yes, let's go. So that was like the bond that him and I had together. Um, he would also say that the way to my heart is through my stomach because he knew that I liked to eat. So he would say, whenever you find a man, I'm going to tell him the way to her heart is through her stomach. Um, so I also would embarrass him a lot at Subway because, as some of you know, I don't have a filter. So... I would say things to customers, and he would be like, oh, Mary Lynn, please think before you talk. And I would totally embarrass him. Speaking of embarrassing him, when I was a teenager, I loved to ask him extremely awkward questions just to see the look on his face. Things like about the birds and the bees or um, some other things that I probably can't even mention here. And because I love just seeing the look of embarrassment come across his face. Um, and up until his very last birthday, I would always pick the most awkward card that a daughter could buy her dad um, that was kind of inappropriate, but more like the potty inappropriate, just to see him um, be embarrassed. So that was my tradition with him. Um, and my dad, he always knew how to throw a good party. And he would always try to get my friends to do their talents and be like, what talent do you have? You know, and get everybody up there. Um, my dad was extremely active in planning my wedding to where he planned all the food. He came with me to buy my dress. Uh, he did so much of the planning to where I don't even know that I did much of it. He, like, kind of did it all. So, um, And then two weeks before my wedding, I moved back in with my parents. And um, every time I would hear him get up, it did not matter what time, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., I would hear him either coughing like he does in the morning or whistling and I would smell the coffee brewing, and I would get up. And he would tell my mom, it does not matter what time I wake up in the morning, Mary Lynn is up with me. And I'm like, well, I enjoyed being with my dad like a lot. So that was, and I still did that when I would go to Pine Mountain. I would get up as soon as I would hear him up. Um, so also, right before I got married, he said, Mary Lynn, I think it's about time you learned how to cook. So I'm gonna teach you three recipes, and you have got to know how to cook before you get married, because that's not right. So um, one of the meals I still um, do is shepherd's pie. That's the meal that my dad taught me how to make. And then after I got married, um, you can imagine that I had a really hard time leaving and cleaving. And my husband would be like, I'd be, there'd be a problem in the house, and I'd be like, oh, let me call my dad, let me call him, he knows everything. And John would be like, honey, um, let me figure it out first. We do not need to run to your dad every time there's a problem. So I had to learn that in my marriage, not to do that. 
And then um, when I got married, we lived in the guest house, and all of a sudden, seven months later, I got pregnant, and I'm in my parents' guest house. It's a one-bedroom, and we're telling them, listen, we're going to have a baby. We need to move because um, we don't have enough room here. And my mom was like, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. So my dad literally that night drew up plans to do a two-bedroom in the guest house. And that next day, maybe, he was already tearing down walls and starting the plans for that guest house. So that was pretty amazing. That was my dad. Um, and then the things that I will miss about my dad or is we would go on yearly vacations to the lake, mainly. I will miss that a lot about him. I will miss his eggs Benedict in the morning that he would make for me, knowing that that was one of my favorite breakfasts. I will miss his presence in a room. He had the best sense of humor and just so easygoing and mellow. Um, <clears throat> So when, I, when he was in the hospital, he would tell me, Mary Lynn, we cannot look back. We can only look forward. So that is what I'm trying to do right now in this time, is to only look forward and not looking back on the what ifs, why, why, you know, maybe we should have done this. So that's what he told me. I was the one that would pick him up to, um, for this last Thanksgiving to take him to and from the hospital. And it was an hour there, an hour back, and I did that twice. And on my way back, he was like, Mary Lynn, this means the world to me that you would be picking me up and doing this for me. So that was one of the last things he said to me. And the last time I saw him, my mom and I dropped him off and I insisted, I don't know why, but I insisted that she come to drop him off with me. And we dropped him off, we got him all comfortable. This is my last time not knowing I'm gonna see my dad. My mom was like, hey, Mary Lynn, we get outside. And she goes, I think we can see dad's window from there. And I'm like, really? So we walk up to his window, we wave at him, he's smiling. And I don't know what it was, but I turn around and I start walking and I'm like, I'm gonna turn back and see if he's looking. So I turn back around, he's still watching me and I'm smiling and waving at him. And then I keep walking and I'm like, mom, look, he's, he's looking. And then I look back, we wave, not knowing that that would be my last time to see him. So I will actually cherish that vision that I had of him is um, smiling and looking back. When my dad took his last breath, I don't know what it was, but I had like this big peace about it, knowing that he was no longer in pain. It was really weird. It was like I could just feel that presence of him being with the Lord, and it just really helped me feel really, really peaceful, and it made me realize that his work on here was done, and God had a perfect plan for my dad, and that I will see him someday. And I actually told him, Dad, I'm really jealous of you right now. You're going to a better place than we are right now. So that is what I will hold. You're up. <laughs> Don't know how she did that without crying at all. This is not going to go well for me. Okay. But I did just get off the phone with Elvis Presley. And he said he's on his way, but he's running a little bit late. I'm just kidding. That's something my dad would usually do. <clears throat> Unless John, where's John Lloyd? You want to come up and do Elvis or no? Okay. Oh, okay. Some of this is going to sound like Travis's because of the man stuff, but <clears throat> my dad, uh, what a man, right? What a man. He was the exemplary husband, the exemplary father, the wise and kind businessman, and the relentless creator. Losing my dad has been the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with. He has been the biggest role model and inspiration to me in my life, and I just can't begin to tell you how much I, I've looked up to this man here. My dad is the, is the man's man. The earliest memories of my dad were of him tucking me in every night and saying, Brandon, always be a man. With the hand like this, actually like that, that's the hand. Right? You know, Daniel, that's the hand right there. Ah. And then we'd share some grunts. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh. And, uh, uh, uh. Right? All that stuff. All the Tim the Tool Man sailors. That was, that's what we did every night before bed, right? And we'd grunt and then he'd leave, right? Uh, right? Um, a couple years later, he uh, actually, years ago, he told me that, you know, maybe I overdid it and all that manly stuff with you, right? <laughs> because I was still grunting every time I saw him. <clears throat> but I told him, no, Dad. I said, Dad, like that phrase, you have no idea how impactful that phrase was on me, right? Uh, and 
it's, uh, it just had this massive impact on my life, and it's because I had, I had the dad that I had and that we had as the example of what a real man is. Men don't complain. Men work hard. Men provide. Men are strong and good, good protectors. Men don't cry. What are you doing? Men, <laughs> men are kind and generous with their time. Men are full of forgiveness and grace. Men are patient. Men are confident and humble. Men love their wives, their children, and their grandchildren. Men are slow to anger. All of those traits I saw consistently throughout my dad's life. And I will tell my boys to be men every night in hopes that I can be that example to them as well. In 2009, my parents moved to Pine Mountain. I think it was 2009, but that's what I wrote here. And sold... Nicole and I, the Chatsworth house. Um, if you were, some of you were, were there before Dad turned it into what it was, but it looks nothing like what it did back when we first bought it. He turned it into a very beautiful home. It was horse property, and he put a pool in and everything. He made it really nice. Um, at the beginning, I would call my dad for help all the time for silly things like, uh, you know, how do you fix a sprinkler head? Um, what else would I say? You know, like, uh, how do you fix this running toilet? Should I cut this red wire right here? <laughs> Stuff like that. A few years ago, I had, I had an idea that, uh, that I wanted to continue my dad's work on the house, right? He put so much work on it. He was constantly working on improving it. So I wanted to do that as well. And I also thought it would make me closer to him. It, it would give us something to share a passion about because, um, I don't necessarily think I had that thing that we both kind of had in common. And so doing that was something that I think that we could bond over, just like Mary Lynn would bond over the morning breakfasts, right? That's how he said it too, breakfast. And so I went to a vice room all the time, calling him multiple times a day, sometimes three or four times while I'm in the same Home Depot after like six hours. And backsplashes, I would, the latest project I'm right now is I'm painting my kitchen cabinets, which I don't recommend, it's awful. And uh, he always said he hated painting so much, and now I fully understand that. About a year ago, he started calling me his mini-me. And I can't tell you how good that made me feel. Just even being a mini version of my dad would be incredible. It's like a mini Superman to me. He told me he was so proud of me just a few weeks ago before he died. In the last text he sent out to us siblings as he laid in a hospital bed, what sounds good, but before that was, the best things are yet to come. It will be exciting to see what God has in store for our lives. It's hard to see that right now as we mourn what those best things are. But for him, the best things have come. Right now, he is right now walking with his creator and his savior. His body is fully restored and made perfect. He has a clean bill of health and he's probably already starting to build all of our mansions up there. And this one's from Shannon Reese, but she said, they're probably gonna be missing a couple electrical outlets. (laughs) Or the covers at least. My house is still missing a couple of those. My, my dad was a real man. And he was that man because of how he lived out his faith in Jesus. The ultimate perfect man. I will always miss him. I will continue to try to make him proud. I love him and I cannot wait for us to experience those best things that he talked about. That have not yet come when we're all together again in paradise. Thank you. Well, first I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here and the calls and texts and food and, oh my gosh, like so many things. Thank you to everyone. Um, I want to start off by asking because we've been getting text and call and messages one after another of these. How many of you 
were, saw my dad as a father figure, a mentor, or someone who impacted your life tremendously by a show of hands. Yeah. My dad was probably the most enthusiastic person I've ever met or seen. Everything he said and did was full of excitement. I remember with this new house he built, we would sit, on, sit out on the front porch and he would just go, man, isn't this the life? Does it get any better than this? Everything was like that. And I recently found out that he told my mom, they had a conversation and they were talking about friends and he said, well, I don't really feel like I have a best friend. If I did, it would be Gene Vanderford. I don't know where you are, Gene. But he said, why do you need friends when you have your family? And that's like the epitome of my father. Everyone in his family was his life. Everyone was his best friend. It didn't matter if you were a daughter, a wife, a cousin, a grandchild. He just loved his family so, 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 so much. Um, Thanksgiving was like such a special thing for my family. Um, I think about, what was it, 12 years ago we started hosting it? Does that sound about right? 12 years ago? And that was my favorite meal to cook. And looking back, it's probably because my dad and Caesar, my husband, were my sous chefs. And I looked forward to cooking this meal every year. I'd plan my menus like two months in advance. And there was one year, this, we would have all of the extended family there, right? So there was one year, we were about to start plating the food and we had about 10 more people show up than we knew were coming. And my dad was always so optimistic and this was one of the first times I, saw, I heard him say, I don't know if we have enough food. <laughs> I know, I, he actually did say that. And so he was mixing the mashed potatoes, and I look over, and he's pouring a box of instant potatoes into my beautiful mashed potatoes. And I look over, and I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? And I get this look from Caesar, and he goes, Babe, you cannot talk to your dad like that. So every year after that, my dad would buy a box of instant potatoes and he'd pull it out when I'd ask him to mix the potatoes and go, you know what would really make these potatoes great? <laughs> Every year. <laughs> I, what did he do with that box? Was it the same box? Who knows? I digress. Um, Thanksgiving this year was the last meal I got to cook for my dad. <laughs> December 4th, 2021 was one of the days that I dreaded my whole life. <laughs> seeing my dad hooked up to all the machines, he would have hated us seeing him like that, right? It was very, very hard to see. It was, again, a day that I dreaded my whole life. But on December 8th, the following week, we got a gift. We got to go to the funeral home, and as terrible as that all is, we got to see my dad again. And um, this was before they were able to do anything to him. I know that sounds very morbid, but um, we got to see him again. And I don't know how this happens, but he had all the color back in his face. He had rosy cheeks. He had a small smirk on his face. And the amount of peace he had on his face was indescribable. It was such a gift. Um, this week I had a friend tell me that a couple years back she had a family member who was in the hospital with a terminal illness. And his granddaughter was with him. And while he was in the hospital, he coded. They brought him back. And he woke up apologizing profusely. And his granddaughter said, Grandpa, why are you apologizing? What are you apologizing for? And he looked at her and said, it's going to happen again. And I'm sorry because next time I'm not coming back. Because what I just saw was too incredible to leave again. And that was the look on my dad's face without those words. 
We can only imagine the incredible things he's seeing, the incredible house he's building without California permits and inspectors <laughs> and all the things he hated. It's going to have a deck on it where we can all sit out as best friends again and hear him say, man, does it get any better than this? While he was in the hospital, all he kept saying is, I want to come home, I want to come home. He did get to go home. Not the home he thought or we thought he was going to, but it's a home much more incredible than the one that we thought he was coming home to. Thank you. I don't know about y'all, but I've been to a lot of funerals, and this is by far the most beautiful celebration I've ever seen of a man's life. How about you? Just to see, yeah, we can, we can thank God for that, how everything is connected to him living out, you know, his faith in the way that he did and being a man. Thank you. And also, thank you guys for bringing up Subway, because when you guys were lined up right there, I thought you were going to make me a sandwich, Travis, for old time's sake. Thank you for bringing up his giant hands because I thought that I was like just remembering something, but that was true. He did have, man, the most manly hands. So we're going to invite up uh, Thomas, his brother, and we're going to hear from Mr. Kimmer's brother. today. Is this on? Okay. To celebrate my brother Gary's life. I am Tom and I've known Gary for 68 years and I have many fond memories of him. I remember growing up in Northridge. In our neighborhood there were only girls our age to play with. Emily was my friend and Vicki Susan was his. The girls were nice enough, but they had no interest in building forts in the backyard or pushing us down the street in go-karts we made out of roller skates and two-by-fours. Uh, yeah, I knew this was going to be a problem. <laughs> Our parents made sure that the boys they raised would have something to contribute to society. They instilled in us a good sense of moral judgment, ethics, and principles. And as time went on, we helped our parents build a home in Chatsworth. It would be one of several. While going to high school, we both got jobs working at Canoga Pipe and Supply. We received quite a hands-on education in the building trades while working alongside several senior co-workers. And it proved to serve us well in the coming years. In the early 70s, I went into the Air Force. Gary went to college at Bob Jones University in South Carolina, where he met his future wife, Mary Ann. They were married for 48 years and have four beautiful children who are here today. Gary worked at Lockheed as a supervisor. When his job was eliminated, he became a Subway franchisee. He liked it so much that he convinced me to open a store after I lost my job at the GM plant in Van Nuys. As a side note, my mom and my brother were dreamers and always planning the next new venture. When mom was approached by Gary with one or more of his ideas, she would respond, hey boy, I think you've got those rose colored glasses on again. In the case of the subway, he had good instincts. And as for Mar mom, she borrowed those rose-colored glasses when she came up with the idea of building a dinner theater in Mariposa. <laughs> Years later, Gary sold his store and moved to Pine Mountain Club. Gary cared deeply for his family, church, friends, and community. He was always willing to lend a hand where needed. He gave so much of himself and to others for that reason, I believe the Lord called out to him. Gary, it's time. I have an assignment for you. 
and I can't wait. You can see I'm standing in front of the Rainbow Bridge. The souls of the departed must cross this bridge before they are received at the pearly gates. It's a long road that will accommodate many souls, most of the time without any problem. Here in heaven, however, we're experiencing our own pandemic due to COVID-19 on earth. In heaven, we call it a pandemic of souls. I watched you build that beautiful home in Pine Mountain Club, and I noticed the amazing driveway, and I realized what had to be done. Gary, you need to build back better. That worn, pothole-ridden road leading to the pearly gates. And in return, I will give you the resources you need to build a beautiful mansion overlooking the ninth hole of the golf course. Now, in heaven, projects get expedited quickly. Gary has already finished the road. He's almost finished with the mansion except for one bathroom above the garage. I believe this is just the beginning of Gary's service to the Lord in heaven. I love you, brother. I miss you. God bless you. Marianne, are you ready to share? Thank you for coming. I appreciate all of your love, your support, your prayers. We've just been so touched. And in the midst of all the grief and all the sorrow and all the sadness, I have such peace. And I know that's from the Lord. And I think my kids feel it too. So thank you for your support. Um, my children. <laughs> I've been so spoiled the last two weeks. They just keep passing me around from home to home. I feel like a little vagabond, but the love and the care and the nurturing they've given to me has just been insurmountable. I thank you, God, for all the blessings that you have given us, all of us, in the midst of tragedy. Little Lily Ray Lynn, <laughs> who gets a baby four days after the passing of the most important person in your life. And Brandon and Nicole decided to add the Lynn because Gary Lynn Kemmer, um, and we added the Lynn, so it's now Lily Ray Lynn. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, in the hospital, it's COVID time. You can't go in the hospital. We got a doctor who we did not know he called us and said that you need to come because he's not gonna make it. And I want your family to be there. We just could not believe it. So we went to the hospital, he arranged it for us and um, let all, well, Travis was on a phone and cause he lives in Colorado and the other three and myself were able to share Gary's last three hours with him. That doesn't happen anymore. And we had a Christian nurse who came and said, I'm gonna get suspended for this, but I'm not, I don't care. She said, I want my patients to have family around them when they pass. So we had wonderful moments there. A nurse walked in when we were talking about our little Lily and we were all excited to meet her because she was coming in four days. And a nurse walked in and said, hi, I'm Lily. We said, of course you are. And she prayed with us. And she wasn't a nurse, actually, she was a chaplain. And she prayed with us, and it was just so special. Um, Connie, my sister-in-law, flew out and surprised me on um, just a couple days ago. Thank you, I can't even think. I'm in a fog, in case you can't tell. 
Um, what a blessing. She was my brother's wife, and I went through this with her when my brother died at 50, and now she's here sharing it with me, and it just means so much. Um, I'm trying to think of all. Um, I can't, it's a hard, th they're a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, but today is about Gary. God blessed me with 48 years of marriage to an amazing man. I, I don't even know how it's going to look without him, but I look at my mom. She didn't have that time with my dad. A lot of people don't get that much time. And I think that's where my strength is coming from, is from, of course, from the Lord. But Gary, who gets what I had? <laughs> it's, it was very special to be married to Gary, who never got mad. He, just like they said, he rarely got mad. He was patient. He was kind. He was loving. And believe me, I took patience. <laughs> and he had it. <laughs> I was very blessed. And again, he was so hardworking. He built the house we have in Pine Mountain now. And we were looking forward to sharing it together, and uh, it's going to be tough, but God gave me this amazing neighbor, Teresa, and Sue and Jean moved to Pine Mountain, and Adele, I, I can't even tell you, Monica, although you, she's leaving me, <laughs> but I mean, I've been blessed with so many, and I'm, there's others, but thank you so much for your love, and um, through this difficult time in our life, um, he's always been my rock. I, I just lean on Gary for everything, and I've got to learn how to not do that, but now it's going to make me lean on God a little bit more. Um, um, he was a wonderful father. I, I saw the love he had for his children. I don't think he had favorites, really. Oh, no, I <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she says that she was, so. Um, <laughs> um but even when he was building or working, he worked right up until the day before he got sick, but he would always drop everything when the kids called and wanted to talk to him because that was so special to him. He was a grandfather to nine amazing grandchildren. We can't even, I can't even believe we were so blessed with wonderful, beautiful, sweet grandchildren, and he just loved them all. And the most happiest times for Gary when they'd come up and give him a hug or tell them they loved him. He was very, very loved by his grandchildren. Um, we often talked about how God blessed us with this wonderful family, and we knew that it was special for us to have this. And to have them all here today with me is very special. Um, Gary loved to travel, and we did a few trips before. Um, in a short period of time, we did about four or five trips. And our last trip was to Texas. That was... Uh, very s surreal because the day we got back is when he got sick. We both did. Um, but my little Micah and my little Jonah, I think they both asked me, do you regret going to Texas? And I can't regret that trip at all because Gary has had this little thing about John Hagee his whole life. He's always wanted to meet him and go to his church and I said you know what Gary let's take a break from the house and go to Texas and go to they were doing a special weekend at the Cornerstone Church in San Antonio Texas and we did we went to the church we had Jensen Franklin as a speaker we had Mike Pompeo we had um, the best fireworks you've ever seen and that was Gary loved fireworks and I said Gary there you are you know the best you've ever seen and I made sure that he got to meet John Hagee. And my kids know I can make that happen. <laughs> and <laughs> so John Hagee was wonderful to him and Matt Hagee, they were so sweet. And uh, it was really Gary's bucket list to do that, so we did it. And when we came back, of course, we both got sick and I recovered a little faster than Gary did, but um, he was feeling better, so, but he needed to go to the hospital for the leg that he was experiencing and I told my grandchildren God doesn't make mistakes he doesn't he called Gary home and it wouldn't have mattered if we'd gone to Texas or if we hadn't gone to Texas he was called home and I have a piece about that that he is where he is supposed to be today with or without our Texas trip 
Um, one thing that John Hagee always used to say, and every time Gary heard it on the messages, he always said, get over and give it to God. Just get over it and get, give it to God. So I heard that all the time at home. Anytime there was drama in Pine Mountain, <laughs> and we Pine Mountain people know that can happen because it's such a small little town. We all love each other, but he'd always say, people just need to learn to get over it and give it to God, you know, and it was really special. I'll never forget that. Um, trying to think of... Um, I think that's, I'm afraid if I say too much more, I'm going to cry, but I feel that Gary is home with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for that I'm thankful, and I'm hoping he's getting to visit with my brother Steve and my mom and my dad and many that have gone before him, and I know that he's where he's supposed to be, and my sister, I know she's listening. During the time Gary was in the hospital, my sister was in surgery for cancer, had um, a tumor removed, and she's cancer-free. And we were both, Gary and I were both thrilled that she pulled through the cancer. So he got that wonderful news before he passed. I miss him very much. I actually can't visualize my life without him. But I know he's looking down and smiling at all of us. And God is saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thank you again for coming, and you don't even know what this means to us. We love you all. Thank you. And now for what I can only imagine would be Mr. Kimmer's favorite part of the ceremony today. We're going to have his grandkids, Maya, Micah, and Jonah, and Ava, share a poem.
dream that you did to oh why oh why can't I I, I well I see trees of green and red roses too I'll watch them bloom for me and you and I think to myself If I had only known the last time would be the last time I would have put off all the things I had to do I would have stayed a little longer Held on a little tighter Now what I'd give for one more day with you No, the road you walked was anything but easy You picked up your share of scars along the way oh, But now you're standing in the sun You fought your fight and your race is run The pain is all a million miles away The only scars in heaven It won't be long There'll be no such thing as broken And all the old will be made new And the thought that makes me smile now Even as the tears fall down Is that the only scars in heaven yeah, Are on the hands that hold you now Not a day goes by that I don't see you You live on in all the better parts of me Until I'm standing with you in the sun I'll fight this fight and this race I'll run Until I finally see what you can see Oh, the only scars in heaven won't belong to me and you There'll be no such thing as broken And all the old will be made new And the thought that makes me smile now And even as the tears fall That the only scars in heaven. Okay. Right. One more. One. Right. <laughs> on the hands that hold you now.
How does one follow Gary Kemmer? Four years ago, um, I was asked to go to our community meeting, which I'd never been to in Pine Mountain Club. And uh, I wasn't neighbors yet. I mean, my house was there, but it was kind of sitting for a long time. They started and finished in a year. We just finished it at 12 years. And Gary, by the way, put our first doorknob in our interior door, so that was exciting. So I went there to lobby for our little miniature horse that had been donated to the community for therapeutic purposes. Um, and just being around this little guy named Mr. Biggs is um, like a little piece of heaven there. And they were having a couple of discussions during, during this meeting, and, and one of them, this big thing, was about chickens in Pine Mountain. Nobody wanted chickens in Pine Mountain. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, what is the big deal about chickens in Pine Mountain? And nobody was making any sense. It was all illogical. And then Gary was on the board. I didn't know him yet. He was on the board, and, and he said, well, okay, I get it. You guys don't want chickens, but here's the thing. I barbecue chicken on my porch, like, all the time. And there's no problem here. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I like that guy. He's got brains. He's got logic. And um, he didn't win that fight. But what he did win right after that was the community to support Mr. Biggs. And uh, that is a gift that keeps on giving. Marianne and I, now that I'm their neighbor and it's the best, I wouldn't move anywhere but being their neighbor, Marianne and I would take walks. I have a little special needs daughter and we would take walks and everything. I'd be like, you know, the pool's so great, you know, Gary jumped in and got that done, you know, and I go in that spa and she's like, yeah, because Gary made sure that he, Karen, you know, Karen, you gotta have that spa, it's gotta have that spa, which thankfully he did enjoy and Marianne being the mermaid, she was there twice twice a day while it was open. But we'd walk and i go, look at that house up there. Isn't that house pretty? Oh, that was our house. Gary built that house. We drove up once and I could barely, I'm sorry, but I could barely uh, get down. I was so scared of that driveway. Wherever, we would walk by the, the community where, the, where you grow food and she'd be like, Gary planted those boxes. He would, I mean, everywhere. And he did it without ego, you know? He just did it because he was giving to his community, to his family. And I consider myself part of that. Anyone, they may not know his name, but the things that he put in place just there will be a gift that keeps on giving for anyone that has the you know, fortune to go there. And through all of his kids and Marianne, you know, he chose a strong woman he chose the best woman out there that he could ever possibly find. And uh, his energy is strong, where we are strong in his family, and it'll remain strong in Marianne. And um, anyway, the day after he passed, we were sitting quietly, Molly and, and Marianne and Brandon, and I said, did he have a favorite song? And she went, he did have a favorite song. A Neil Diamond, Pretty Amazing Grace. And so I told her that I would learn that. And we have been working on it. So my husband, Victor, hasn't played in a long time, but I, I told him he's going to do that. So here we are to, the, to honor Gary. Amazing grace is what you showed me. Pretty amazing grace is who you are. I was an empty vessel, you filled me up inside, and with amazing grace restored my pride. Pretty amazing grace is how you saved me. And with amazing grace reclaimed my heart. Love
love in the midst of chaos, calm in the heat of war, showed with amazing grace what love was for. You forgave my insensitivity and my attempt to then mislead you. You stood beside a wretch like me. You're pretty amazing. was all I needed. Stumble inside the doorway of your chapel. Humble and caught by everything I found. Beauty and love surround me. Freed me from what I fear. Ask for amazing grace and you appear. You overcame my loss of hope and faith, gave me a truth I could believe in, showed me to a higher place, showed your amazing grace. When grace was what I needed, Look in the mirror, I see your reflection. Open a book, you live on every page. I fall in your there to lift me. Share every road I climb. And with amazing grace, you ease my mind. I came to you with empty pockets first. But with amazing grace, you showed me that it can. In your amazing grace, I had a vision. From that amazing place, I came to be. Into the night I wandered, wandering aimlessly, found your amazing grace to comfort me. You guys would join me in a closing prayer. Father in heaven, we, we give you thanks for the life of Gary Lynn Kemmer. We thank you, Lord, for the grace, Lord, that you extended to him, to so many here present today. And I thank you, Lord, for a life, Lord, that has impacted many. I thank you for each of the children, Lord, that you brought into this world through Gary and Marianne, and I thank you for lives that have been shaped by them. Lord, we thank you for the great opportunity today to really just be blessed, to celebrate 
this man, his life, and your work in him. And Lord, in faith, Lord, we, we release him to you, O oh Lord God. He never belonged to anyone here, for he was bought with a price by your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we praise you for all that you have done. And Lord, I thank you for all that you are doing and all that you have yet to do through the lineage of this man. I thank you for children and grandchildren. And Lord, should you tarry in returning great-grandchildren for as many generations as will be blessed by this life. Lord, I do pray, Lord, your continual comfort for Mary Ann and each one here today. I pray, Lord, that in the nighttime hours, when sleeplessness visits, that, Lord, you would lay your hand upon each heart and every mind. And that, Lord, where grief runs its natural course, your grace, with all of its sufficiency, Lord, would follow up, healing hurts, and ultimately reminding us, as your Holy Spirit's job is to do, to remind us, Lord, of the great blessings, Lord, that you have brought into the lives here today through this man. And so we praise you and ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. It's been an honor to host uh, the celebration of life today for Gary Kimmer. And on behalf of the family, I want to say thank you so much for coming out, for all the kind words, for everything that's been shared. Don't forget to say the things that you want to say today and be in the, the moment here. But as you exit, there will be a reception at Brandon and Nicole's house just down the street. And if you need directions, we'll have those in the lobby for you. But thanks so much for coming today.